Welcome to DBD TV, the spin-off of Dragon Ball Dissection where I explore the changes, mistakes, corrections, and original material created for the animated adaptation of Dragon Ball, Dragon Ball Z. If you're looking for my overall analysis of the story, characters, and themes of the Cell arc, you're not going to find it here because I've already covered it and that would be boring for everybody. So be sure to check those out if you're interested. The animated Cell arc ran from November 27th, 1991 through July 21st, 1993. For reference, those points in the Dragon Ball manga see Vegeta starting his fight with number 18 and breaking a punch machine. Right off the bat, the first change we see is that the opening animation is updated. Now, this had actually happened once before, partway through the Saiyan arc, when images of landscapes were replaced with new shots of the heroes and villains. In this new variant, the villains are updated once more from shadowy science to shadowy scientists and technology. The showcase moment for the Earthlings is replaced with Vegeta and Trunks, and the final cast shot is updated with one based off of Toriyama's title page for chapter 337. My own personal tastes lead me to prefer the second variant overall, but this is a good and necessary update. Let's jump right to what everyone wants to hear about. The episode wherein Chi-Chi forces Goku and Piccolo to learn to drive. I got a lot of flack two years ago when I quipped that this episode is overrated. Pitchforks were everywhere, I barely survived. Well, I was definitely trying to tease people, but I meant it. Come on, overrated does not mean bad. I enjoy this episode quite a bit, I just don't think it's the best filler episode like so many other people seem to. I doubt it would even make my top 10 if I had a top 10. But there is certainly a lot to love, from the clear inspiration it takes from Toriyama's 1990 color specials, to the totally rad outfits Goku and Piccolo wear, to the hilarious gags and over-the-top competitive character dynamics. It's not especially meaningful, but it's great disposable fun. Considering the episode ends with both characters failing to get licenses, this excursion seems like it would shoot them in the foot later on when Goku does, in fact, competently drive. But they actually address it, adding Kuririn to this scene so Chi-Chi can explain that after the events of the episode, she begged the Institute to take Goku back so that he actually could get his license. It's a bit of a sloppy retcon, but I'm amazed they deal with it at all. If I have any one complaint about this episode that diminishes my enjoyment, it's how unappealing it looks. Aside from episode 87, which I talked about last time, this is probably my least favorite Seigasha animated episode in terms of the art. This is still at the point where they haven't gotten out of their Frieza arc slump. Goku in particular looks butt ugly, and his body proportions are just ridiculous. He's sized more like Bane than Goku. If you were wondering what he's supposed to look like, well, this outfit is based on a Toriyama drawing too. The cover for Dragon Ball Volume 22. Quite frankly, I much prefer the preceding filler episode over this one. If I did have a top 10, this one might be in it. You may recall that one of my issues with the Cell arc is how completely unmotivated and unrealistic I felt the romance between Vegeta and Bluma is. Case in point, I can't even use a manga image of them to illustrate it because they barely have any scenes together. While I still feel there are a lot of insurmountable hurdles inherent to the premise, this episode does its best to bridge the gap. While the series seems to get confused from episode to episode in regards to whether or not Vegeta is gravity training in a ship or in a room, it's actually one of the better character episodes Dragon Ball Z ever does. We see Vegeta wrestle with his feelings of inferiority and need to be the best. Yamcha likewise puts himself in dangerous situations out of what is clearly a need to compete with Vegeta, and Bluma is noticing Vegeta's internal turmoil and is being drawn to it. I think the best thing about the episode is what it doesn't say. It's actually surprisingly subtle. 
There's no romance here, no breakup, but it develops the characters in ways that make it far easier to connect the dots to that point. At the end of the episode, when Yamcha smiles to Puar and announces he's going on a training journey, what it really represents is him coming to terms with change and stepping aside. It's a fantastically mature Dragon Ball episode, and while there is certainly room for stories of wacky hijinks too, it disappoints me a little how much the driving episode seems to overshadow this one. The early episodes of this arc do better by Vegeta in general. The animated Frieza arc already set up a far more logical trajectory for him by having him leave Earth rather than stick around and eat barbecue. This, of course, is where the other shoe drops, and it's the biggest improvement the TV series opens up for itself by shifting the manga's Frieza arc cliffhanger ending into the Cell arc's peaceful beginning. Having been unsuccessful at tracking Goku, Vegeta is forced to return to Earth, his only potential safe harbor. Realistically, a lot of this fish-out-of-water stuff would probably have been dealt with in his first 130 days on Earth that exist in either continuity. Even so, it's important to get to see it, to see the characters discuss what to do with this guy. It's awkward for everybody. I love Vegeta sheepishly calling out for the Earth Woman while he's in the shower, and I have no idea what Toriyama's original intention was with the whole Batman outfit, but the TV version makes an inspired choice by rendering it in the most garishly mismatched color scheme of pink shirt and bright yellow pants. Besides being hilarious, it visually sells the idea that Vegeta does not fit in here. And he shouldn't. This and the following episodes likewise demonstrate that Bluma is the only character who can stand up to Vegeta and is beginning to show interest in him. Even far later on, Kurudin chastises Vegeta over his selfish pride that has allowed Cell to become perfect. It's not much, and it's just to his unconscious body, but at least the series is dealing with some of the biggest problems of this storyline. It's high time I follow up on a point I made in a prior DBD TV arc. When I covered the Saiyan arc, I talked about how the addition of domestic Son family activities required they create a home for that family to live in. They crafted it as an extension of Goku's childhood home, which is seen briefly in the earliest of Dragon Ball stories, and they named that area Mount Paozu. It wasn't until the late Frieza arc that Toriyama created his own version of a home for Goku and his family. It's only briefly seen there, but gains more prominence in the stories of the Cell and Buu arcs. And it does not match the Mount Paozu idea at all. It doesn't even appear to be in the same location as where Goku grew up. As I said then, I think the Mount Paozu home is far more charming than Toriyama's design, but that's not why we're here. Since that brief Frieza arc appearance is cut out of the anime in favor of Chi-Chi's adventures to get to space, it's here in the Cell arc that Toei finally has to deal with the fact that their Dragon Ball does not match Toriyama's Dragon Ball in a relatively significant way. The animated series seemed to really be at a loss as to how to handle this inconsistency in Domicile. It's one of those things that's easy to miss if you're not paying very close attention, so let's start off by establishing the physical differences in the houses. Yeah, I know, sounds riveting, but it's important. In Dragon Ball Z Episode 1, the Mount Paozu house consists of three parts, when you exclude the older, separate Son Gohan home. Two perpendicular Eastern-style sections surrounding a rounded, capsule-style house. The outer wall of the capsule house is emblazoned in a kanji meaning good fortune. We get a good look at Toriyama's take on Goku's home in chapter 329. It's similar, but doesn't quite match what little we saw during the Frieza fight. Did Toriyama change his design, or was that, in fact, Gumo's house? At any rate, we're going to go off of this one. It's a somewhat similar but distinct capsule-style house, with what appears to be a garage or shed behind it, and a car on the other side. The front door features a different kanji, meaning long life. Got it? Good. All of that's going to be helpful in a second. The first episode of the Cell arc largely takes place at the Son home, and the Mount Paozu house persists unchanged, despite it adapting material that takes place in the Canon home. In addition to a clear establishing shot, the manga gives us a glimpse of Gohan's room when Kurudin calls him, and it's clearly not the same room in its equivalent animated scene. The animated version is shown to be situated at what appears to be this window in the Eastern-style house section. The manga version has rounded walls and longer windows, consistent with the outside of Toriyama's design. When Gohan flies off to confront Frieza, the shot is changed from Chi-Chi and Yumo looking out the front door of the Toriyama house 
to them hanging out the big window of the Paozu house. At first, the TV series seems content to simply ignore Toriyama's version and stick with what they've established. But then things get weird. When Gohan and Goku return from the Frieza battle a few episodes later, they come back to a completely different house, the Toriyama house, as the scene where Goku smashes Chi-Chi through a tree is recreated directly from the manga without alteration. Or is it? That comic scene is punctuated by a distant reaction shot from Piccolo, where we can see the Son home in its entirety. In the manga, unsurprisingly, it's the Toriyama house. However, in the anime, it's... I don't know what it is. It's not the manga house, and it's not the Paozu house. I guess I could say it's an inverted Paozu house. It's now two capsules and one traditional house. Not only that, if we look to the earlier establishing shot, it appears to be only one capsule house, but it still features the Paozu style kanji, both in meaning and placement as opposed to the Toriyama door kanji. I don't know where they're living, but it doesn't match the manga house. In the driving episode, it's back to the Paozu house, but by the end of that episode, when the manga material kicks back in, the house seems to be Toriyama's. It's an exact recreation of its manga panel equivalent. You can definitely make out the capsule and the car. However, perhaps because the manga version is obscured by a text box, this rendering still features the Paozu style kanji. I guess that means even after the three year gap, we're still not in the right house. From inconsistencies to jumping back to earlier designs to mixing design motifs, they couldn't have screwed up this transition more if they tried. I figured the use of a time skip would have been the perfect excuse to just drop them into a new house without any explanation. Just start the arc there and everything is fine. But no, the house slowly morphs into its new form. By episode 131, it seems to have completed its transformation into the manga design. Whew. I always knew I'd be talking about this eventually, but even I never realized until now how insanely inconsistent it is in those handful of episodes. While it took some time, animated Dragon Ball discarded their old house. However, they just could not bring themselves to drop the name. Now, when I covered this in the Saiyan arc, I totally dropped the ball regarding the pervasiveness of the name Mount Paozu to refer to Goku's home. I initially claimed the name was discarded by this point. I later corrected myself, adding it continued to be used in movies and GT, but the fact of the matter is, it never really went away. It is used sporadically in late Dragon Ball Z episodes and in the sequel works to this day. To be clear, it's not in any way part of Toriyama's original Dragon Ball series, but the name has definitely persisted in the Dragon Ball lexicon. Quite a legacy for something attached to a filler element so awkwardly backpedaled on. It'd be like if they added dialogue of Dr. Gero saying he never could have finished his artificial humans without the help of Dr. Frappe. Unlike the Saiyan arc, which significantly filled out the one year of training before the arrival of the Saiyans, the Cell arc only adds two episodes despite the time elapsed being triple the length. I guess they figured after all the time they took out for the Garlic Jr. arc, pausing for another extended filler session was a bad idea. But obviously they still needed to buy time. In the early sections of this story, recurring filler cutaways tend to be one of three plot lines. Chi-Chi and Yamcha taking care of Goku, Gohan transporting Bluma, Yajirobe, and Baby Trunks, and Kame House. Not much to say about the first two, so let's just blaze through them. Since they put a bunch of filler scenes prior to the first manga instance of Goku taking his medicine, it changes the context of that scene from we don't know where the medicine is because Goku put it away three years ago to we just used this medicine five minutes ago but somehow we lost it. Also, the show never seems sure whether Goku's medicine is liquid or pills. Gohan is stuck in the middle of Bluma and Yajirobe fighting or bossing him around. Bluma uses Yajirobe's scarf as a diaper, pretty standard stuff. Chaozu is dropped off at Kame House, so we get a teeny tiny amount of him feeling worried or neglected, and him finally being appreciated over what a good cookie is. Glad to see someone care about Chaozu. But the primary focus is the return of Maron. Yes, Kuririn's girlfriend from the Garlic Jr. arc returns because she has realized she loves him after all. They actually use her status as an outsider as an excuse to give an extended recap of the entire Red Ribbon Army arc, 
which is probably a good idea given that it was a few years old at this point. Maron sticks around for several more episodes, which actually gives the sea turtle a little bit to do as he fights off some rude guys who try to pick her up. I do find this a bit odd, though, given that it was an earlier filler bit that established the sea turtle has a laughably pathetic battle power. Ultimately, this plotline concludes with Maron running off with a bunch of other guys. In order to spare Kuririn's feelings, the Turtle Sage states what could be considered the ethos behind most filler. Let's never speak of this again. As you might have noticed, Oolong is here. As I pointed out when I covered the manga version, Oolong technically does not appear within the pages of the Cell arc. Obviously, due to the anime restructuring the end of the Frieza arc to be the beginning of the Cell arc, Oolong's appearance in this era is shifted into the arc proper. But beyond that, he makes appearances in several filler scenarios throughout the story. Good for him. Surprisingly, a common recurring motif with filler in this arc is what I call wave training. As far as I can tell, it's a visual they plucked out of movie 5, where Goku goes to Kame House and fires Kamehameha's toward the ocean. This arc opens with Kuririn doing the same thing. Later on, Gohan does it. Later still, Goku does it. A lot of waves. The funny thing about the Gohan one is that it's situated as Gohan sneaking behind Chi-Chi's back to train instead of study, thinking to himself that what he really wants is to become stronger. I'm certainly not saying Gohan can't enjoy both, but it does seem like Toei is unknowingly stepping a bit in the wrong thematic direction here, given the conflict towards the end of the story arc. Another recurring filler motif in this arc is nightmares. Characters have nightmares a lot, sometimes accurately depicting other characters they've never seen before. For example, we have this fun one of Goku watching helplessly as number 17 and number 18 kill his friends and family before killing him. This is despite the fact that he has another nightmare earlier where they're just amorphous blobs. It was already silly when the manga established Goku hearing in his sleep everything he missed, but this is just ridiculous. Then we get the infamous nightmare Gohan has in the Room of Spirit and Time, where Cell barges in and kills Piccolo and Chi-Chi. This one's especially funny when you couple this scene to the one where Gohan complains to Goku he can't imagine Cell killing his loved ones because he's never seen Cell before. Turns out the power to imagine Cell killing your family was inside you all along, Gohan! But Gohan's filler troubles with nightmares go all the way back to the first episode of the arc, where Chi-Chi hires an abusive tutor to literally whip Gohan into shape. Well, he does that, but I don't think that's what Chi-Chi had in mind. Anyway, Gohan falls asleep at one point and dreams that his father is returned, only for Goku to morph into Frieza. It's a nice reminder of Gohan's trauma, as well as foreshadowing Frieza's return. Gohan wakes up, stands up for himself, the tutor badmouths Goku, and Chi-Chi throws him out of the house. Again, literally. Since most of the recurring filler cutaways are resolved by the middle act, Endless Island Adventure needs its own. One of them is once again Kame House, this time with fewer ex-girlfriends. It's a bit more straightforward, with the characters reacting to the nearby battles. I had a minor gripe about this section of the story in the manga where Yamcha just randomly disappears partway through. I think he does once where it's a straight up port of a manga scene, but other than that, his long trip to the bathroom has been commuted, which makes a lot more sense. It makes a little less that Chaozu is back. Tenshinhan took him back home before Cell showed up and hasn't been present for any of the activities following that. Why is he here again? I mean, sure, he could have come back on his own, but it's just weird. We do get a moment where Yamcha suggests the two of them should enter Endless Island Adventure 2, but the Turtle Sage convinces them not to. The other frequent cutaway is to Goku and Gohan in the Room of Spirit and Time. This typically happens once an episode, often right after the commercial break. I like these. I already feel this is the best bonding period of Goku and Gohan, and these scenes just supercharge that. Father and son are really cute together. But speaking of supercharging, the anime really zazzes up the Room of Spirit and Time. Using the establishment of extreme temperatures as a jumping off point, the animated version adds periodic bouts of literal fire and ice attacking the characters. One of these sequences also adds in what motivates Gohan's first Super Saiyan transformation. While locked in a furious beam struggle with Goku, Gohan flashes back to all of his failures, all the times other people had to carry his weight for him, and that's what causes his transformation. The TV staff was all about this because they do the same thing for Vegeta. 
After he surprises everyone with his ability, we are treated to a flashback of his dangerous training in space that pushes him over the edge. Between these and the Trunks special recontextualizing Gohan's death as Trunks' first transformation, it's clear that Toei wasn't too keen on Toriyama's decision to relegate Super Saiyan discoveries to trivial off-screen events. Speaking of the Trunks special, since it technically aired as part of this arc, I can mention it here. I freely admit I got this from Herms because I never noticed this before. Trunks tells Goku that Goku dies soon after the time frame of their meeting. He also says that he will be born two and a half years from the present time. Unless he's being very liberal with his meaning of soon, it seems pretty likely that Trunks isn't born until well after Goku dies. In Dragon Ball Super, Trunks explicitly says as much. But at the beginning of the Trunks special, Baby Trunks is present for Goku's death. Make of it what you will. Make of me ending the video here what you will. As you might have expected, there's a bit too much to look at for simply one episode. I wouldn't say, however, there's enough for four parts like when I covered the Frieza arc, but there are still lots of inconsistencies, filler storylines, and oddities to go, not to mention production details. So tune in next time as we conclude our look at the animated version of the Cell arc. And I do mean next time, as it will be the next video in two weeks. Yes, it will be a double dose of Dragon Ball Dissection. I can't wait for all the surprised comments next time from everybody you didn't watch until the end. But if you're new here, Dragon Ball Dissection is an ongoing series. If you want to see more, you can make use of this tidy playlist of every video. And you can check out my latest experiment, Donkey Kong Dissection. Yep, with a big enough scalpel, even a Donkey Kong can be dissected. I will see you next time!